Praise the Lord. We want to welcome those who will be joining us this morning through Facebook. Uh, if you have friends who aren't on Facebook but they want to find us, all they have to do is go to YouTube and type in uh, Word of Life Ministries of Covington, Virginia, and let them know that, uh, that the good word has been brought forth here. If you're blessed and you want to share that blessing with others, we would appreciate you doing that. We're so glad you're a part of this service with us. I'd rather you be here in person, but we're glad that you're with us, however the means is. Whether you watch it live or whether you watch it down the road, the same anointing carries through because in the Spirit there is no time and there is no distance. And I know that there are people who are watching this on the other side of this planet. You, some of you have sent us messages, and we are so glad that you are with us, so glad that you can be a part of this service with us. God bless you. We have the same dad you do, our Father God, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be his name. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. This church on the hill in Covington, Virginia, is being viewed by people on the other side of the planet. Think about that. One of the things that b before Jesus returns was that the word would be published throughout all the earth. Who would have thought, if you would have asked my grandfather, if somebody in India or Africa could take part, or Australia could take part in a service that we were holding here in this area, he would have said, that's impossible. But now, it's possible. Amen. So thank God the word is being spread throughout the whole earth. And uh, we, uh, th this, a couple days ago, I, I, every so often I'll tune in to CBN News just to pick up on the headlines. I, I hardly watch any news outside of Christian or there's some conservative programming that I'll just to get, stay up in with what's going on in the world and, and, and in our nation. CBN News is a good source because it's a Christian perspective. And, uh, you can go to the site, to the part of it where you, that you just get the headlines. The, the, they give you like a, a, a three to five minute excerpt of, of the stories that are going on. The first one that came up when I viewed it was, was out of Harrisonburg, Virginia. It's made national news that there is a group of teachers and parents who are taking the Harrisonburg school system to court over indoctrinating our children. Yeah with tra transgender ideology. So they are taking them to, so Lord, we just ask you right now, give wisdom there, show them how to proceed, and we thank you for a favor, Lord, that this, this demonic, this demonic mindset will not be pressed upon our children. This stuff is being done without the parents. I encourage you, go view it. Just YouTube, CBN, or you can download it if you have Roku, Download CBN News channel, and you can you can view it for yourself. There there the the, the the there are those not all everybody in the school system is not of this mindset, but there are those in high places who are trying to indoctrinate our children without the parents' knowledge. And uh, thank God, people are standing up. It's time people stand up. It's time people that have some some uh, morality about them stand up. If we don't stand up, who will? If we don't stand up, who will? Hallelujah. In order for someone to, have a, to, to know what direction to go, they have to have a moral compass. And if you don't have a center to you, and our center is Jesus Christ, died, buried, and raised from the dead, and we raised together with him. If you don't have, if you don't have that, that moral center, how do you know? How do you have a moral compass? You can't. Anything goes. And thank God for the truth. Thank God that there are people standing up. The second story was talking about Russia. How that they are clamping down, trying to clamp down on the, 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 the Jewish people who dwell in Russia from going back to Israel. And how there's a mass migration right now of the Jewish people out of Israel because they have a, listen to this now, according to the reports that they gave, they have a very short window for, the, for those is, uh, Jewish people, people of Jewish descent, to get out of Russia to go back to Israel. Israel has arms wide open. And this is another prophecy being fulfilled. Friends, we're in the last days. The trumpet's going to sound. Livia says, just give me five more weeks, just five more weeks. 
the trumpet's going to sound. And the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And those of us who are alive and, 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 and remain are going to raise together with them to meet him in the air. Hallelujah. Encourage one another. Comfort one another with those words. That should bring us comfort, not fear. Oh, no. Oh, no. Comfort one another with these words. We're going to see him face to face. And we're going to be as he is. Glory to God. Move at the speed of thought. Not the speed of light, the speed of thought. Think about it. Hallelujah. Oh, that day's coming soon and very soon. What do we do in the meantime? We have work to do. Every chair in this building ought to be, ought to be occupied. There ought to people, be people standing. We should have to go to three services a Sunday. If we're doing what God's called us to do, we're taking the brakes off. And, 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 and Edie brought out, Miss Edie brought out a while ago that as you see the day approaching, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. I heard Jimmy Evans make a statement. He said, he said that he had read statistics that said that 60% of the people who stopped going to, to church because of COVID have not returned. 60% of the people. COVID is still around. I know it's real. I don't say it's not real, but I know the healer too. I know the healer, and I know that we're free from fear. God's not given us a spirit of fear, but power and love and a sound mind. But the mindset of the devil is keep the, keep the, 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 the porn stores open, keep, the, keep the, 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 the pubs and the saloons open, keep, keep the ABC stores open, keep the marijuana stores open, keep the, 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 the drug stores and keep the other stores open, but close the church. And you can go to a football game and scream at the top of your lungs, but you better not sing praises to God because you might make somebody sick. I'm telling you, if that's not the devil, what is it? Whew. I get worked up when I start talking about things. I know you're not used to seeing me get red-faced. But I get worked up when I start talking about things like this. Because that's the devil trying to stop the church, and the church has given in to it. We've got to come up out of complacency and not be afraid. I don't care if they take me off of YouTube. We'll find another way to get the word out. I'm not afraid of being censured by the enemy. I'm afraid of not pleasing my God. Mm. All right. Thank you, Jesus. I think I mashed that soapbox. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You glued it well, brother. If you, didn't, if, if you didn't know what Brother Frankie Johnson built, when we first started this church, we needed a pulpit. And Brother Frankie did woodworking. I know you didn't say that for me to bring this out, but he does wood, he's a good woodworker. And I said, Frankie, we could, we could use, we could use a, a pulpit. And I was just thinking something small, and, and he built this, solid oak. Praise God. Give him a hand clap. He, you know... I told him one time his fingerprints are all over this church. And there's other people here who are the same way. Your fingerprints are all over this church. God is good. Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. We said we were going to pray for Brother Jason who's, who awoke with a fever today. And, and uh, you know, we have the report of the Lord. We have the report of the Lord. When you go to, to the doctor to have a test, I used to pray... Pray that I get a good report. I used, to, I used to pray with people that they would get a good report from the doctor. I don't do that anymore. You know why? We have a report from the Lord. Now I don't negate what the doctor says. That, that may give me something to know to stand in faith about. And I don't say it's not real. But I do say this. I have the report of the Lord. No matter what the report of the physician says. No matter what the report of the test says. I have the report of the Lord. His report says I'm free. His report says I'm healed. His report says I'm filled. And I'm going to stand on the report of the Lord. And if I stand there, I know I'm standing with him. And he's standing with me. 
I know I'm in his presence and he surrounds me and is in front of me and behind me. He is my shield and my buckler. He is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I'm under his wing. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So I'm not dependent upon what the, what the report of the world says. I, I thank God for, for wisdom that God has given me and natural wisdom and understanding to put together medications and things to help fight disease. But I also thank God for the stripes that Jesus bore on his back because by his stripes I was healed and when man comes to the end of his ability God is well able hallelujah and he's not just able he is willing and he's not just willing he has accomplished it for us and we can reach out and take hold by faith of all that he has accomplished for us. So Father, we lift up Jason to you right now, and we ask you, Father, anoint him right where he is in his house. I thank you that your favor covers over him, and the blood of the Lamb has cleansed him, and by the stripes of Jesus he was healed, whatever's causing this fever. We thank you, Father, that that house is cleansed, that house, that house is cleansed, that house is, 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 is uh, mm, mm, the blood of the Lamb burns away the virus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, when we make a stand in faith, you don't deny. You don't deny that stuff is out there, and you don't deny that you're under attack, but you deny the victory in your conversation. You deny that it belongs to you. You deny that you have it, that it's your possession. It's okay to say, I'm being, this is, this is a, an attack on me, but greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. This is an attack on me. I know you see the symptoms in my body, but I stand on God's word, which is stronger than fact that you see truth changes fact. And the truth of God's word, God's word is truth, Jesus said, changes the facts that we're dealing with. Don't be swayed from that no matter what the enemy brings your way, no matter what some well-meaning Christian brings your way. Oh, yes, but you have to face reality. What is reality? Reality in my world is what my God says. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Well, I, that, that one's for free. That, that, was, that was not part of what I planned on preaching this morning, but that one was for free. Somebody here or out there needed to hear that this morning. Aren't you thankful for Holy Spirit? Hallelujah, I'm so thankful. Well, you know that we have been talking about in our morning services, the past nine or ten services where I ministered, we've been talking about the, the, the ministry of the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Jesus is the head, and the Word, I, I don't pull that out of my own thoughts. The Word tells us, the Bible tells us, that Jesus is the head, and we, the church, are the body. Head is the center of instruction. The body is the center of action. When Jesus, who when he walked this earth in the flesh, he was the fullness of the body. When he walked this earth, he, he and, and, and came into his ministry as the, 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 the Son of God, a man anointed by the Holy Spirit, the, price, the, the one who was going to pay the price for our sins. When he moved into his earthly ministry at the age of 30, the first thing he did, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted. And you remember for the 40 days, Satan came and tempted him. And, 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 then, and then the first thing Jesus did after he came out of the wilderness, he overcame those temptations with the word. And the enemy also, you know, if you read it, study it out, uh, Luke 4, you see that the, that the devil, 3 and 4, the devil used the word to try to twist, twist him up. You know, you can take the word out of context and say a lot of things. Take the word in its context. The word will always back itself up. It will always explain itself. And Jesus combated that with the word, combated, combated that confusion with the light of the gospel, the, go, the light of the good news. And, and, and he came out of that, that place victorious. He went into the synagogue and the first thing he did after he'd been separated and anointed by the Holy Spirit, he, he went into the synagogue and he said, bring me the book of Isaiah the prophet. And he turned to what we know as chapter 61 and he read from that from that book. And we have done this uh, in these services. We've done this because he gave his mission statement there. And if it was his mission statement and he was the fullness of the body, then it's our mission statement because now we're the body. He's the head, we're the body. So if it was his mission statement, it's also our mission statement. So Luke chapter 4, 
verses 18 and 19. Brother, if you'd bring that up, let's read this together. And don't just read it like you're reading, like you're reading off of this, off of this uh, uh, page up here, off of this screen. Read this as your mission statement as the body of Christ. Let's read together. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to the bro- heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, we've been studying this. That's your mission statement. If you wonder what you're supposed to be doing, and I've had people tell me I just don't know what my role is, well, go to your mission statement and start doing some of those things. And I guarantee you, as you start doing some of those things and you put your hand to do the last thing God told you to do, he will show you the next step. You ever been there? Hallelujah. So start doing that. We talked about this, how we are a spirit, a soul, and a body. We are a spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body. And, and we've been talking, we've been going through and taking our time with this teaching. Because this, I believe, is vital for the church. And I have really been, we talked about the spirit of man. We talked about what happens at salvation. And, and now we're on the soul. And I've been on this for, for a couple of services. But it's because, I'm going to tell you why we're, why we're, I believe the Holy Spirit is having us slow down here. I believe that this is the area where most of the Christians in the world today have most of the problems. This is where most most healing is, needs to take place this is where this is where most uh, 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 reformation needs to take place when we're born again now you think about it when you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that we're made a new creature in Christ Jesus we're literally made a new creature in Christ Jesus our spirit man is made new your spirit is not healed after you're born again you, you, your spirit is developed. Your spirit's not wounded. Your, your spirit is, is, when you were born again, you're made a new creature in God's image. You have his DNA. It doesn't have to be restored. You just have to train your spirit. You have to feed it the word so it can grow. He designed us. He never designed us for our soul or our body to be in charge. He designed us a spirit being made in his image for our spirit man to be in charge. To be the one who, who's calling the shots, so to speak. Working together with your soul and your body. Now, if I didn't see, if, if, if your soul and your body weren't involved, I couldn't see your spirit. Because just sitting look, looking at you where you are right now, I see your flesh. And when, you, when, you, uh, uh, when your character comes out, I'm, see, I'm hearing and seeing your soul express what's within you. Amen. And, and, and if we give our soul dominance, our soul desires to be entertained, it desires to be petted, it desires to be a whole lot of things that are, that, that are not good for us. Amen? But if our spirit man works, if we give our spirit man dominance and we're feeding our spirit the word, and you, the way your spirit receives the word is through your reading, hearing the word, reading the word, communing with the Holy Spirit, your soul and your flesh are involved. And they're the gates through which, through which your spirit can be fed. Yes, you spend time communing with God and, and in your spirit you're, you're, you're ministered to. But understand how closely together, especially your soul and your spirit work. And there are many people who all their lives have been totally uh, controlled by their soulish desires. Your soul consists of your mind, your will, and your emotions. There have been people who through all their lives have been totally controlled by their, their thought life, their emotions, the, 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 the things that, that are happening around them, totally swayed and controlled by that and have never developed their spirit to the point where they can, they, they can give their spirit man dominance. Well, when you're born again spiritually, you're a baby. And you have to feed your spirit the word so that it can grow and mature. And you begin, you begin to renew your mind to the Word. And as you renew your mind to the Word, you see the order that things ought to be in. And your spirit man, you give your spirit man dominance. Rather than, than acting on emotion and rather than acting on surrounding pressures and the pressures of this world, we check down in our spirit and see, is this a step I should take? Y'all with me this morning? Now, I'm going to back up to Romans 12, 1 and 2. Verse 2 says, 
And this is on page 11 of your notes if you, if you have your notes with you. And I'm going to give you some little nuggets along the way. And I'm not, I'm not going to preach all this again, but I do want to, there's a couple of things that I want to bring out to you. Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A couple of things I want to bring out to you. If you go and you look at what being conformed to this world and tra but transformed by the renewing of your mind, if you look at those two words, conform and transform, if you look that up in the Greek, You'll find that the word conform in the Thayer's Dictionary, I use Thayer's and Strong's. Now, I don't want to try to get too technical. I don't read Greek, but I can read, I can read Greek dictionaries. So can you. The Thayer's Dictionary says conform means to fashion one's mind and character to another's pattern. To fashion one's mind and character to to another's pattern. He's saying, be not conformed to this world. In other words, he's saying, don't allow this world to conform, to fashion your character or your mind to its pattern. Don't allow this world to fashion your character. Don't allow this world to fashion the way you see things, the way you speak about things. Don't allow this world, and this world is constantly trying to put pressure on you. If you've ever seen a, a, a mold where they use pressure to mold something, they'll put, a, they'll put an object in there, or a metal or plastic or whatever it might be, they'll put it in there and it's just a glob. And then this high pressure presses come together, and, and there's a mold, and, and, and they force that metal, or they force whatever the material is, into the voids of that of that mold and when it comes back apart you have a perfect image of what that mold is that's what the world is trying to do to us on a daily basis that the world is through 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 imagery through messages through tv different different some of these things are they can be used for good but understand and realize they can be used for evil as well trying to conform us into its image and form our character Character, character is, is the expression of something from what's within us. Characters, when you look at an apple tree and you see apples on the limbs, what you're seeing, you, don't, you, you, you know that's an apple tree because of the apples. The apples, is like, that's like our character. You see the inward nature of that tree because of what's on the limbs. Your character expresses your inward nature. The fruit of your life expresses your inward nature. There is fruit of the flesh. You can look over to Galatians 5. It gives us, a, it gives us the works. It's called the works of the flesh. And the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is that one who is walking in step with the Holy Spirit and has given their spirit man dominance. You will never have the fruit of the Spirit when your soul is in, is in control. The fruit of the Spirit is developed best when your spirit man is in control in fellowship and union with Holy Spirit. That's what walking in the Spirit's all about. It's not some something out there in the left field and you don't have to always be having visions and seeing angels and you don't always have to you don't always have to be walking around singing psalms and saying hallelujah to be walking in the Spirit. It means that in my heart I'm constantly aware of his presence. It means that in my heart I honor him at all times. When I'm doing my manual labor or when I'm doing something in the natural, I'm still aware of my God's presence. And the Holy, I'm, I practice the presence of Holy Spirit. And, and when things come my way, I'm meditating on the Word. Therefore, when I deal with it, I deal with it from a standpoint of strength from the Word of God rather than a standpoint of what this world's trying to pressure me into doing. If you want something to go a certain way, you can press it and leave a, an opening and make it go that way. A lot of times that's the way the enemy will do us. We used to raise cattle. We raised, we, we, we raised Herefords. And the Herefords, when you stood in front of them, and went, ha! they'd turn. Then I went down south and Edie's grandpa had Brahma cows. Down there they call them Brimmers. And, and those are the most hard-headed bovines you'll ever deal with 
And I went out there, and of course, here I am. I'm trying to prove myself. Edie's grandpa basically raised her, he and her, her grandma, so that was like her mom and dad. And here I, he called me the Yankee. So I went out there, and I was going to help him corral some yearling uh, uh, cattle for him to take to market. And I was trying to prove myself. You know, I was trying to show what a man I was. And on the way out to the corral, Clint looked at me and he said, Now, if they start hassling at you, you get out of the way. I never heard that term in my life. What's ha hassling? What are you talking about? Well, though, he, he, he got those cattle and, and he, had a, he had a pretty good sized corral, brought them in out of the field and got them in there. And then he, we were trying to get them over into the chute to go up into the trailer. And those yearlings came up there, and we're talking about five, six hundred pound cattle. And, and, and uh, they came up in there and they started, they're, they're not like Herefords or, or, or Holsteins or, or, or Angus, you know, where they come up and just kind of stand there and look at you like, what are you doing, stupid? Those things, when they came up there, they had fire in their eyes. And they started running like deer, started running in circles. And, that, and when they came by me, they're going, <laughs> I found out what he meant by hassling. They were hassling at me. Well, I'm, man, I'm going to stand my ground. And, and four or five of them broke off from a pack and started from the herd and started running straight at me. And I'm doing this. And they keep coming. And I say, hey! And they keep coming. And I say, hey! And they keep coming. And they got about a few feet from me. And I stepped out of the way. I was born at night, but not last night. And when those, when those yearlings got to the fence. It was a board fence. I'll never forget it. Had a, had a post about that big around where they hit. When they got to that, they just never slowed down, never put on the brakes. They, at the lead one picked his feet up like that and put his head down and right through that broke it, snapped that post off right at the ground. Broke out of the corral. I felt like I'd failed. I looked over at Clint and he was kind of grinning at me. And he, he did get some to go to the sale. But my point there was, we were trying to force them to go the way we wanted them to go. And that's what the world will do to you. In the spirit, you better start hassling when you sense the world trying to make you go to the sale. Because the sale meant they were going to the butcher. You think about that. And the devil, he's going to roar like a lion. He's going to wave his arms. He's going to holler at you. He's going to say, no, you go this way. You better go this way. You're going to die. You better go this way. And what, he, what, he, what he's not telling you is if you go that way, you probably will die. Y'all still with me? Don't let the enemy force you into their loading chute. Now, that might be a country, way, a country boy way of bringing a point across, but I think everybody here got it. Hallelujah. Be not conformed. Don't allow this world to, 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 to fashion your character, but be you transformed. That word transform, if you look it up in the Greek, one of the words that, that stand, stood out to me in, in, in the definition of transform was metamorphosis. Metamorphosis, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. What's, the, what's one, uh, one, one thing that comes to your mind when I say metamorphosis? Insect. Butterfly, caterpillar. Caterpillar goes into the cocoon of caterpillar and comes out a butterfly. That's what you do when you transform your mind to the word. You transform. Be not conformed to this world, but be a transform. You go into the cocoon of your meditation upon the Word. Hear what I'm saying. Go into the cocoon of your meditation upon the Word. Close this world out. Close the outside pressures out. And go into the cocoon of the meditation. Your meditation on the truth. You saturate your soul. You saturate your mind. You saturate your thoughts with what God's Word says. Saturate your spirit man. Saturate yourself with the Word of God. And when you break out of that cocoon, when you come out of that place of meditation, you went in a worm and you come out a butterfly. 
You come out changed. You come out not one who crawls on the ground, but you come out one who soars above the storm. They that wait upon the Lord, that's your, med- that's your cocoon of meditation. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They will mount up on wings as eagles. Meditation. Meditation is part of this transforming our mind. My mind is my thought process. It's not this gray thing between my ears. Everybody here, if we cracked open your skull, all our brains would look alike. But everybody here has a different mind. You realize your mind is not talking about that gray matter. Your mind is talking about your consciousness. Your thought process. Amen. But the way that your your brain is used for your mind to express itself, that organ of your brain is used... What you have been putting into that is what causes is, is, is what determines what will come out of that. Even though we might have very similar brains, and some of us have smaller brains than others. I don't claim to have a big one, but the one I have, I'm trying to use it. They may look alike, but what comes out of them can be totally different. And it's determined by what we've been putting into them. What we've been spending time running around in them. You know, if we cracked our head open, I hope that we would see meditation on the Word, not not a circus. Amen. Preach it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. God's Word is good. Y'all still with me this morning? We must adjust our diet. And I'm not talking about what you're having for supper. I'm talking about the diet of our soul. If we want to change our physical body, we change our physical diet. If we want to change our soul, we change our soulless diet. And we have to change its activities if we want to see change. Well, what do I feed my soul? Jeremiah 15, 16 said, Thy word were found, and I did eat them, and they were the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Psalm 119, 103 says, Thy words are sweeter than honey. Your words are sweeter than honey. And let me give you a little insight here. Let me give you a little something here. Be cautious about a need for entertainment. Be cautious about always needing to be entertained. In my satchel, in my briefcase, my satchel, whatever you call it, just don't call it a man purse because that's not what it is. I I, I have a a briefcase. There There is a cell phone. I use it as a tool. Sometimes I use it for entertainment. But I believe that that, that, though it can be one of the most powerful tools in our hands, it can also be one of the most Deadly poisons. Understand this, parents. Parents who are out there, your children, if you don't have limitations on that cell phone, there is nothing in this world that they can't find on most of these cell phones. There's no evil that they can't pull up. Be aware. Just be aware. Be cautious of a desire for entertainment. And let me say this. I'm I'm going to tread on some... Sacred cows here. Church is one of the prime places we have to be cautious about desire for entertainment. If we go to church to be entertained. Entertainment. There 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 is Christian entertainment. I don't belittle that. But we go to church to come together with people of like faith to minister to the Lord. And as we do, we know he will minister to us. But my heart needs to be, I'm not coming to be entertained. I'm not coming to, I'm not coming to, to say, wow, look at that. And let me say this. We're just, we're just getting down to the nitty gritty. Whenever people are being ministered to in the front, don't be a spectator, be a participator. I can't tell you the times we've been in meetings where the God was moving tremendously and somebody down, down, down front was being ministered to or somebody in the congregation would be ministered to in a special way and rather than rejoice with them, a lot of people are going, oh, ha, ha, look at that, ha, ha, look what the, ha, ha. And they're looking and they're being entertained and I've seen it time and time again. Kill the anointing. Kill the anointing. Hmm. Be cautious of a need to be entertained, especially 
in church. Last time we, we met, we talked about 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 20. This is a very important passage. It says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver. This is talking about, this is, this is giving us a, 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 an example of the church, the house of God. There are not only vessels of gold and silver, the body of Christ, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. We're going to stop and talk about this in just a minute. If God, preadventure, would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. We talked about this, and I told you about the experience we had with the potter. Uh, we were attending a church, and he was talking about in God's house there's all kinds of vessels. There's some gold, some silver, precious vessels. Then there's wood, some of wood, and some of earth. He said clay is, clay is earth. He said, you know, you might be a sewer tile in God's house. You might be, it might be your, your position in God's house, a sewer tile. And he left it there. He was, he was telling people, some of you are going to be shiny gold, and some of you are going to be sewer tile. You just need to be thankful for who you are. He didn't read the next verse we're talking we're talking about the soul how we have to renew our mind to the word how many of you have ever in the past you don't have to raise your hands but you had you had your mind went to the gutter you had a sewer tile mind well what do you do you got to change it you got to change it you're the one who controls what you think about if that were not true then philippians chapter 4 7 8 and 9 Six, seven, eight would be false because it shows us there what we are to think about and the perimeters that our thoughts need to be in. He told us how to control our thoughts and he gave us a wonderful filter to run our thoughts through. Amen. It says here, if you realize that you are a vessel that is not bringing honor, Purge yourself. Let him purge himself from these. Who purges you? You do. You can't say, okay, God, change me. Go ahead, I'm ready. I have to, pur if, I'm, if I realize I have stinking thinking, or if I realize I'm acting in a way that's not becoming to God's truth, I'm acting in a way that does not portray God's character, the fruit of the Spirit is not being manifested in my life, but the fruit of the flesh, the works of the flesh, then what do I need to do? I need to purge myself. I need to purge myself. What's purge? You get out that nasty stuff. If you want to be a vessel of gold, you want to be something that brings glory to the house, then purge yourself of these things that would cause you to not bring glory to the house. Too many times we want somebody else to do it for us. You know, there comes a time when the baby's diaper, you need to stop changing the baby's diaper and he needs to be potty trained. Amen. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. He said in meekness, verse 25, instructing those that oppose themselves. Instructing those that oppose themselves. Instructing those that oppose themselves. That literally means to resist the truth. One translation says where it says oppose himself. Instructing those that resist the truth. And we, we, last time we talked about how, how we come out of that place where we're not bringing honor to God to the place where we bring honor to God. And I, I made the statement, you are not doomed to stay in your mess. You know, you can be born again. You can go to the altar and, and be born again and be clean and, and a new creature in Christ Jesus and still in the soulless realm be a, a, a mess. But God didn't leave us there. He showed us how to change that. 
And it's a process. Your soul, your, your soul is a process to renew. Your spirit man is made in God's image instantly. You're made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus instantly. But you have to renew your mind to the Word. Renewing your mind means change the way you think about things. Jesus gave us some examples of how that we don't have to stay in a place where we have fallen. Let's say we're walking along in our Christian life. And, 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 and for, for a time we give ourselves over to things that don't bring God glory. Let's say we get in an argument and we say wrong things. We say things that we know didn't bring God glory. Or let's, 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 say, let's say we get involved in an activity and our spirit man saying, Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Now, let me, let me just stop right here and say, don't sin thinking I'll repent later. But if you find yourself in a sin, if you find yourself where you've, where you've brought dishonor to the family of God, God doesn't, de- doesn't desire for us to stay there in that place of separation. He desires for us, and I showed you his desire for, for the heart that is hurt. Jesus said, I've come to mend the brokenhearted. I've come to mend. That's talking about the soul, to mend the broken heart. He gave us a wonderful example of this in Peter's life. In, in Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22 and verse 61, it says, And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Now, what has just happened, and you might want to turn in your Bibles I know we can bring this up on PowerPoint, <clears throat> but, but I think it's good for us to look in our Bibles. Don't, don't, don't become lazy with the Word. Look in, let's look in our Bibles and see what he says here. Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 22, verse 61, what has just happened is that Peter has denied Jesus three times. He's denied being associated with Jesus. Now, Jesus told him back in verse 31, if you have your Bibles, look back to verse 31 of that same chapter. It says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that you may, he may sift you as wheat. Now, the previous verses, if you read it, you'll see that the disciples were ar- arguing about who was the greatest among them. You know, pride is one of those stinking diseases that makes everybody sick but the person that has it. And, and, and they were getting over into a little bit of pride. That's in the soulless realm. Hey, look at me. Verse, verse 31, Jesus told Simon something here. He said, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Notice verse 32. This is God's heart for us. He doesn't want us to fall. He doesn't want us to fail. He said, but I have prayed for thee. I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now that word converted in the King James seems a little strange. If this mic starts acting up, tell me because the battery is getting low. That word converted seems foreign to us and it is. But in my Bible, if I look over to the sidebar, it shows that what that means is, when thou hast turned again. When you have turned, when you have turned again. He said, I have prayed for thee that your faith fail not, and when thou hast turned again, strengthen thy brethren. Thank God there's always a road home. Thank God there's always a road home. Now Jesus warned Peter and Jesus told him. Peter said, I'm not, I'll never deny you. And Jesus openly told him, before the rooster crows in the morning, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said, no way, Jose, I'll never do it. I will defend you to the death. Peter, has pre- Peter proved this when he drew the sword and cut off the, 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 the servant's ear. You remember what Jesus did? Jesus, one of the gospels shows us, Jesus picked up that old boy's ear and stuck it back on and healed him. And they still took him away to crucify him. Jesus ministering life, peace, and health 
even to those who were taking him away to crucify him. Why? Because he could look past the cross to today where we're standing here bringing him glory. Thank you, Jesus. So, so Jesus told Peter, you're getting ready. You're getting ready to deny me three times, Peter. Then we see in verses 57 through 60 that Peter denied Jesus three times. In verse 61, immediately when Peter for the third time denied Jesus, this is what happened. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter knew he had blown it. He hadn't just blown it. He had royally blown it. And the, when he denied Jesus for the third time, and he added a few expletives with it, I don't know that blankety blank man. I don't know him. I'm not with him. Jesus turned and looked at him and they met gaze. They met their gaze. They met eyes and immediately in his spirit, man, Peter was, his spirit was broken because he knew he had, he had done exactly. He had went right into the enemy's trap. The enemy was desiring to sift him as wheat and he had walked right into the enemy's trap of his own free will. He walked right into the enemy's trap and gee, there Jesus is looking at him, his master, his savior. His savior is looking at him in his eyes and he knows, Peter knows that Jesus knows what he just did. And Peter went out and he wept bitterly. He had a broken heart. He was weeping because his soul was crushed. What did Jesus say? I've been sent to heal the brokenhearted. That brokenhearted literally means bruised or crushed. Soul, that's the soulish realm. Peter in his soul was totally devastated because he knew that he had done exactly what the enemy had bidded him to do. And he was in a bad place. You might find yourself in this place where you have, he was, a, he, when it says he wept bitterly, he was repenting. Lord God, how could I have done it? How could I, Lord, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. But you have to make a choice when you realize you've blown it. What do you do? What are you going to do when you realize you've blown it? What are you going to do? Repent. Well, you know what Peter did? He went fishing. If you look, if you look at John 21, and the first part of that chapter Peter got up and he said, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to my livelihood. And the other disciples followed him. And they went out in Peter's boat and they began to fish. And they fished and they fished and they fished. And it didn't do any good. And they looked over on the bank in the morning and there stood a man on the bank. And they didn't recognize who he was. Now this was three days later. This is sometime after, after this had occurred. This wasn't the next morning after he denied Christ. And they looked over and there stood a man on the bank. You remember when Jesus first called Peter, he was preaching and the crowd was so big, he asked Peter, a fisherman, if he could get in his boat. Peter wasn't his disciple at the time. And Peter said, sure, I'll go, come on. And so he rowed out so that Jesus could address the crowd. And before Jesus got out of the boat, he said, uh, cast your net over into the deep. And Peter said, we've been fishing all night long. And he said, do it anyway. That's Peter. So Peter said, all right, at your bidding. And he did. And remember, they had caught a huge catch of fish. Well, here they are. Peter has denied Christ. This is after three years of walking with him. Peter denies Christ. He denies the, the, the one whom he had said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He denied him. Pe Jesus had looked at him and said, Peter, upon this, shall, this rock shall my church be built. He was talking about that recognition. And here Peter has blown it all. He's denied Christ. When the, when the rubber met the road, he denied Christ. And he, he's out here and he's going back to fishing. Things are just going back to the way they used to be. And he looks over on the bank and there's this man standing there. And he says, hey, fellas, y'all have any fish? And Peter, and Peter and John, they said, no, we don't have any. We have been fishing all night and hadn't caught any. He said, well, just cast your net out on the other side of the boat. Lights start going off in their mind. They said, do it. And they throw the lit net out and suddenly it's full of fish. It says Peter recognized immediately that it was Jesus and he didn't wait to paddle to the shore. He jumped out and he swam to the shore. And when he got over there, if you pick up in verse 15, so when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? More than these, he saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. 
And he saith unto him, Feed my lambs. And again he said unto him, said unto him Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Three times Jesus said, Simon, do you love me? Three times Simon said, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Love you. And he said, Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Three times. And Jesus, how many times did Peter deny him? Three times. How many times did Jesus ask him, do you love me? Three times. Jesus wanted Peter to know, I'm not just restoring you, I'm wholly restoring you. I'm totally restoring you. Now go out and do what I told you to do and minister to the brethren. And Peter was one who was used so mightily on the day of Pentecost. He stood up after the Holy Ghost had come upon him. And rather than be a loser who was who had gone back to what he was, he stood up and he preached the truth to those people. And that day found Thousands received Jesus as their Lord and Savior because of the word of this man who had denied the very one that he was preaching to him. But he knew that he could go back in repentance and God would restore him. You may be in a place where you say God can never forgive me. Oh yes he can. He can forgive you and restore you to a place that's beyond your wildest expectation. He can use you to reach thousands. All we have to do is accept his forgiveness and move forward in his truth. You have time for one more example of God of God showing how 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 He desires to restore us. There's a little man named Zacchaeus. Listen, when he, when he said, uh, Galatians 6, 1 says, Brethren, if you see a man overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one with the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. He didn't say to make fun. He didn't say to talk about. He didn't say to gossip about. He said if they will receive redemption, if they will be brought back into the flock, you go and you help them come back. You restore them. That word restore, that literally means you, you help them get realigned. You help them get realigned. Pity will never realign. Restore the commitment. You may feel as if you have failed God. He wants to restore you. And he gives, he gives those among, among us who are, who are spiritual, who are, who are mature spiritually. If you see a brother overtaken in a fault like Peter, rather than talk about him, rather than run him down, rather than gossip about him, or her. Go to them and restore them. Help them get realigned. Help them. Considering yourself, because none of us are above failure if we make the wrong choices. Amen? Amen? In Luke chapter 19, we see Jesus walking down the street, and there's this little fellow. His name was Zacchaeus. He was a man who was short of stature. He entered. Luke 19, 1, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was chief among, among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and he could not for the press, because he was of little stature. Now, we don't know if this meant that, that we just know this means he was small. And he ran before and climbed up in a sycamore tree to see Jesus, and, 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 for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him and he said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today. I must abide at thy house. We used to sing a song when I was a child. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. You remember that? Well, Jesus walked by and he looked up and he saw Zacchaeus up in that tree. He was up in the tree because he was short. He couldn't see over the people. Now, Zacchaeus he probably had been ridiculed all his life. He'd probably been called everything that you can name. Every, every degrading comment about being short, about being of small stature, Zacchaeus had probably been called it. And he was probably bitter. He was probably bitter. He was probably mad at people. He probably wanted to get even. He had attained a position of authority. He was a tax collector. He worked for the IRS. He had attained a position of authority. And most likely he used that position... When he walked up to the house and he knocked on the door and they answered the door and there stood Zacchaeus and they knew that growing up they had called him every, every shorty name that there was. And here this guy, tax collector, now he's a tax collector. Don't you imagine they used his position of authority to inflict vengeance? You called me shorty, I'm going to call you poor. Because what you have, I'm going to take home. And let me say this, revenge is a soulish endeavor that will only, for a moment, it is sweet to the tongue. 
but it leaves a bitter stomach. It will leave emptiness, a bitter emptiness. But then one day Zacchaeus heard the gospel. He heard about Jesus. And he saw a lot. You know, he, he had inflicted a bunch of vengeance. He had, he, had, he had, in his mind, he had inflicted a bunch of, I'll, I'll get back at you. But then, after realizing the emptiness of vengeance, and being even more an outcast because not only was he short of stature, but now he was the guy who was short of stature who cheated everybody out of their wealth. He was in a lonely, bitter place. And he heard the gospel message. And he wanted more. And he ran to see Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm going to your house. And that man of small stature became a giant that day. That man of small stature decided I'm going to pay back all the wrongs I've done. That man of small stature became a giant that day. Ephesians 4.14 says, So that we may be no longer children, sent this way and that, turned about by every wind of teaching, by the twisting and the tricks of men, by the deceits of error, but staying true. Words and love may come, but stay, staying true, words of love in love may come to full growth. We may come to a full growth in Him who is the head, even Christ. This is the restoring of the soul. We may come to a full growth. Get this, I'm going to give you a few points and we're going to close. Soul growth takes time. It takes commitment. It takes humility. The fruit of the Spirit is direct evidence of soul growth. I pause for effect. The fruit of the Spirit is direct evidence of soul growth. A person's character is seen in how they interact with others. You might want to write this in. It is spiritual. Your spiritual nature is manifesting through your soul. The fruit of the Spirit is your spiritual nature manifesting through your soul. You might want to write this down. The fruit of the Spirit manifests best when your spirit man is in control. The fruit of the Spirit manifests best when your spirit man is in control. One of the reasons we have so many people sick in the soul is that they aren't getting or didn't get soul nurture in the home. And let me say this, and I'll close with this. Parents and those who are spiritually mature help others to grow. Parents help your children to grow. Ephesians 6, 4 shows that Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The number one job of parents, especially fathers, is to expose our children to the nurturing power of God. Now, let's just say you grew up in a home where you didn't get that. Well, it's not too late. We have a Father God. And we have people who are mature in the faith that can help us. If you didn't get that growing up, it's not too late. And, and I'm going to add this, and it might be a little bit rough for somebody to hear. It's not too late, but it's also no excuse. If mom and daddy put your diaper on backward, it's no excuse for you to be a sour person. Renew your mind to the Word. If daddy was mean, mama was mean, there are some mean mamas and daddies out there. Or mom and daddy were so caught up in their own lives that they didn't give you the love you need. Or they never took you to church. Or you didn't walk in, weren't in, raised in a home that honored God. That's no excuse for you to be a mean, hateful person. Or to be a, to, to be a sad sack. Stand up, rise up, get up, wake up, grow up. Amen. Get God's word, it's true. Stand together with me. How long did I preach, brother? 
How much? We got an hour in. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I heard somebody say one time, if you can't say it in 20 minutes, you can't, you can't preach. Well, I can't say it in 20 minutes. Did, y'all, did, did, did I go too long? Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, that's what I like to hear. When the, I tell you, when y'all get to pulling it out of me, it's hard for me to stop. And, and y'all, y'all, just, y'all just pulling it out, drawing on that anointing. If you've been with us on YouTube, we're glad that you're with us. This word is true for you. It's, it, it, there's no distance in the Spirit, and God wants you to know He loves you. He loves you. And if, you heard, if you've been damaged in your soul, maybe you're born again, and, but in your soul you're a mess. We're giving you keys how to turn that around. Renew your mind to the Word. Go into that cocoon of meditation and meditate on God's truth. And don't let the enemy in. Don't let him in your cocoon with you. Just you and the Holy Spirit in there mulling over the Word of God. What God says, who you are in Christ. It's been good to be with you this morning. God bless you until next time.